Tiny Switch has four 10 gig ethernet ports. It sips power, but it still has four different power inputs, a fancy Marvell Prestera switch chip with a real management interface. And the best part is that all of this comes in at less than $199. We have a lot to get into, so let's get to it. Hey guys, this is Patrick from STH, and this is the Microtech CRS304 4XGIN. And if it sounds like we just went through a laundry list of features that this little switch has, and mind you again, this is a $199 or less switch. Um, well, there is a lot more to this than we even went over already. And another reason that this might be such an important switch is that we reviewed this switch over here, which is the Microtech CRS304 a long time ago. This is essentially the SFP plus version of the switch. So a lot of people like SFP plus because you get 10 gig and you can run optics or DAX or whatever you want to go and connect this thing. But on the other hand, if you have 10 G base T, well, um, it's kind of easier just to have a 10 G base T switch. But the problem is that, well, this is inexpensive and low power 10 G base T tends to cost a little bit more because you need extra chips. We'll show you those inside. Plus the fact that it also uses more power. Again, we'll show you this when we get inside the switch. Now what Microtech managed to do with the CRS304 is something that can end up being less expensive, especially if you need that 10 G base T than the CRS305, but it's also much less expensive than the Unify Flex XG switch, which also has four ports of 10 G base T. Now, just full disclosure, Microtech sent us the CRS304 so we could do this video. Unlike Ubiquity, they don't make a sign an NDA that says, uh, you know, you can only say nice things, you have to pre-share anything, anything like that, uh, which is why we don't do Ubiquity reviews because that's way too restrictive. Everybody else signs that, by the way. And this one, uh, I think is just a really interesting switch and we're gonna end up buying more 100% uh, over the time. We've definitely bought a lot of these CRS 305s and these definitely provide a good amount of value and I'm gonna show you exactly why as we get into this. And in this video, you're gonna see a bunch of things that maybe you've never seen before. And the way that we get a lot of the stuff is we just go out and buy it. The way that we get funds and budget to go do that is through our YouTube members. So if you wanna help us out so we can buy stuff and do independent reviews, please go subscribe down below and become a member. With that, let's get to the hardware. Okay, so let's talk about the switch and let's talk about the outside. You know, first off, it is plastic on the top and there's also some plastic on the bottom, but I think that these are actually there more as like a heat shield. So when you touch it, you don't burn yourself and they're less of like, you know, this thing's like super cheap construction or something like that. It's actually pretty well made. But on the front of this, let's get to the big feature which is that you get four 10 G base T ports. Now you can also run these at lower speeds as well, but at least you have the four 10 G base T here, which is useful for a number of applications. Maybe you don't need 24 ports or 48 ports. You just need something to connect a couple devices. That's exactly what the switch is for. So on the side, you're gonna see that we have a little clicky reset button, but then we also on the other side have a PoE in port. This is also our management port. It's not really meant to go and run data over. I mean, you're not gonna be running like 10 gig or anything like that off of there. So it's a low speed management port, but it can also accept PoE in. So the first way we're gonna show you that you can power this is through this PoE in port here. And at this point, you're probably saying, wait, he said that's the first way you can power this. What are the other ways? Well, let me get to that right now. Uh, first over here on the side, you'll see that we have a DC input terminal. So you can go and get some DC power from a battery or whatever the heck you want, plug it in there and you're ready to go. But that's only two. So if we keep turning, we get to the kind of back bottom of this. It's a little hard to see, but under here we have two more DC inputs. And these two barrel jack inputs accept a pretty wide range of input voltages. You can go all the way from 12 volt up to like 57 volt or something like that. And another nice little feature is that there is a little tiny hook for your cable. So if you have a little power cable, you can hook it in there to make sure that somebody doesn't just like go and pull it out accidentally. It's always super useful on these types of devices. But all told, those inputs mean that we have four different inputs on this switch. That is absolutely cool because, well, frankly, sometimes you just need redundant power on these things. And in case you're wondering, ours came with a 48 uh, volt power adapter and uh, this thing is not gonna use anywhere near 40 plus watts. And we'll show you that in our power consumption section. But it also means that you have at least one way out of the box to power it, plus three other different ways. And just in terms of mounting this thing, there's a DIN rail mounting kit that comes in the box, but then there's also uh, these kind of little screw points at the bottom. And then you have nice little rubber feet so you can go put it on a table like this. And uh, you know, it just kind of stays put. And before we get inside, I 
just want to show you that this is definitely a little bit bigger than the CRS305. And most of that is just extra heatsink because this is a 10G based T switch, right? So you do have a little bit higher power interfaces. And so that's just something that I think, you know, I would want to keep in mind if I bought one of these. But on the other hand, if you are using something like the CRS305 and you're putting 10G based T adapters in there, then uh, this is going to make a lot of sense. And one other small thing that I personally really like, I know there are different opinions on this, is that the LED status lights are on the ports themselves. On the CRS305, you had the ports, but then the status lights were on the side. And I just don't like that as much because if you are looking at this and you wanna know which one's lit, it's kind of a pain to like go on this side and look at the side of the switch versus just kind of looking at the switch and saying like, okay, there's four ports, here's which ones are lit and, uh, and operating correctly. Okay, now getting inside, you're really, the number one thing you do is you take off these little plastic bits, which pop off pretty easily with like four screws. And then once you're inside, you see that there's just a lot of heatsink. But showing you this heatsink, there is one other really small, but very useful feature here. If for whatever reason, you lose the little manual that has the, you know, MAC addresses, plus also the admin and the default password for the box. The other way you can look at it is you can actually look at it on the bottom. Now, this is not a very high contrast label that's on the bottom of the unit, but the other way that you can find it if this label gets scratched, you lose the manual, all that kind of stuff. You can actually find the default password by opening this up and it's printed here on the ports. It's a little Easter egg that you wouldn't know if you didn't open the switch up, but there it is. Now, when you look at the top of the switch, the first thing you might think is that that big heatsink in the middle is for the switch chip and you'd be kind of right, maybe? When we pulled off the heatsink, there wasn't a switch chip, there wasn't a phi, there wasn't any big chip underneath. Instead, there was a pad that made contact with the kind of center of the switchboard. And so that tells us that we have something that's pretty darn warm on the other side. Now, the underside heatsink is much larger. Essentially, it takes up the vast majority of the chassis from front to back. And when we take it off, you can see that there's this little molded bit. And then and there's a big pad. And underneath that pad is where we're gonna see our two main chips. Now, the first chip is the Marvell 98DX. And this one is the Marvell Prestera chip. And this is just a nice little switch chip for a low power switch like this. It also allows you to have a dual core ARM management processor and all of the stuff that you need to go and run that management interface for Microtik on the switch. But one of the big challenges whenever you have 10G base T is the FIs. And if you wanna know why switches that are 10G based T use a lot more power and also uh, cost a lot more is just because of the physical interfaces. One of the challenges by using copper wire instead of optics is that as you go over a longer distance, say a hundred meters or something like that, is that you have to do a lot more filtering of the signal to get all the noise out and be able to figure out what the heck kind of data is being transmitted on those wires. And that's why you tend to have very high power FIs and stuff just to be able to push the signal and not get a totally dirty, just junk signal on the other end. And here we have another Marvell chip, which is an 88X3540BXE4. And that's a four port 10G based T5. So some of the switches that you see will have like individual FIs for each port, but on this one, you have a nice four port and that's part of their Alaska series, I think. If you don't know about this, we've been reviewing systems with the Marvell Alaska series FIs for uh, since at least 2013, I think. And even back then they were like one gig four port FIs that were used instead of the Intel FIs built into like Atom C2000 chips. So there are uh, just, you know, this is just a well-known FI brand in the industry and they've been around for forever doing this. And uh, at the same time, it uses a lot of power, which is why you see a lot of the heat sink and really the thermal management is designed to cool this phi. And I don't remember this off the top of my head, but I think that Ubiquiti is also using a pretty similar switch uh, or set of switch chips. They're not the exact same, but uh, correct me of course if I'm wrong, but it's also a lot less expensive. Now, of course the hardware is part of it, but we also wanna know about management, the performance, power consumption, noise, and all that kind of good stuff. Plus what can you even make with this? So let's keep going. Okay, so let's talk about the performance. Now, if you're just gonna do simple layer two, like switching or something like that, then this can perform decently well. That's often what we test, and you can see that we got results pretty similar to what Microtik got. Now, on the flip side, when you start doing things like bridging and routing, and you start adding more layer three features in, you're gonna start to see the performance drop really, really fast. So you're gonna start seeing like things like, you know, two gigabits per second or so. And so, you know, the big thing here is just that this has a ton of features because you have the Microtik management interface, 
On the flip side, the overall performance is kind of limited by the fact that you have a very low power switch chip in here. And so what I would say about this is just remember that this is designed for low power and really just connecting devices over like a layer two network, just getting them to be able to talk to one another. It's not necessarily for like being a core switch that's gonna go give you like full 10 gig performance of like, you know, firewalls or like whatever across all of the ports. It's definitely not that kind of switch. It's more of just, you wanna plug stuff in and you want it to go fast. That's what this is for. With that, let's get to the other set so we can talk about the power consumption. Now let's talk really quickly about management, power consumption, noise, all that kind of great stuff. And also what can you do with these? So let me just kind of show you what we have here. We have a Microtik CRS 304 here. We also have one back here on the power meter. So one thing I wanna talk about is management. This has Microtik standard management interface. Now you're gonna see that we have the new Winbox version here, which is a desktop application that you can use to go and manage things with a GUI and it makes life really easy. There's also a web management interface that largely mirrors the functionality here. And then if you really wanna be a power user, you have a CLI that you can use to go and manage these switches. Now, of course, on switches like these, I think most folks are just gonna use the web management or Winbox interfaces because, you know, like this is a four port switch a lot of people that just need 10 gig ethernet and they just need it inexpensively and easily. And I think that's really what that, you know, this whole management interface is for. One thing I will point out too, though, is that these switches are more of like consumer style switches when it comes to how management is configured out of the box. You don't need to go into the management interface. So you can just buy these things, start plugging in ports and you're ready to go. Now there are of course people that are gonna say that they can buy a inexpensive switch with way more ports on eBay. And a lot of times those switches come unconfigured. And so you have to actually go into a CLI to go and set them up before you can start using them. This is really just a put the power adapter in and then start plugging things in. So it's really, really easy to get started. Key though, is that you do have a dedicated management interface. So you can go and if you have a management network at home, that's all one gig or something like that, you can go plug this in directly there, maybe a PoE switch or something. And then you could have your high speed ports really used for well, high speed things. Okay, so of course, a lot of folks wanna know about the power consumption of a device like this, and that's totally valid. Something that you'll see is that when we don't have anything plugged into this, we'll get somewhere in that maybe seven and a half-ish watt range at idle. When we plug in just the management port, you may go to about 7.7, 7.8 watts, somewhere in that range. And then when you start plugging in the 10 gig ports, you're gonna see that you're gonna get maybe two to maybe three watts per port in terms of additional power consumption. Now, Microtik says that without any attachments, so without anything plugged in, you can get up to 15 watts of power consumption. And so that means when stuff is all plugged in, you can get up to 21 watts. We got like 19 or something like that, but I'm sure there is a way to get a little higher than what we saw. Still though, for budgetary purposes, you can figure somewhere between about seven and a half watts and 21 watts is gonna be your range. And by the way, if you haven't watched our other videos, that's probably a little bit more than the CRS305, but at the same time, it's lower than a lot of other 10 gig switches, especially older ones. Now let's talk about the noise. Uh, there, there are two of them right here and I can't hear either one of them because there are no fans. This is a fanless chassis. It does get a little bit warm, but frankly with the plastic hood on it, um, you know, I'm, I'm not getting any significant heat. I mean, it's warm to the touch, but it's definitely, I just leave my hand there and this thing has been on for about an hour or so. So I, I would say that overall, not too bad. Okay, now I do wanna talk a little bit about some of the things that you can do with a four port switch. Cause I think there are a lot of folks that have big networks that watch SDH and they're like, I don't really know what I would use a four port switch for. There are other folks that are like, hey, I only need two ports, all that kind of stuff. Okay, so first off, if you only need like two ports of 10 gig, we have a bunch of two and a half gig switches with two 10 gig ports. You can see those on our two and a half gig switch guide. So definitely go check those out. But I set up something uh, over here that I thought would just kind of be interesting for folks, right? And really what this is, let me just kind of go through some of the things because some of you've seen on SDH, some of you maybe haven't yet. So first thing, we have the uh, TerraMaster F8 Plus NAS. So this is an all flash NAS, very, very quiet so we can have it on set and it's not super loud. The other thing that we have in terms of network storage is this little Blackmagic design box right here. This little box is called the Cloud Pod, and it's pretty cool. It has two USB-C interfaces that you can do things like plug in these little USB SSDs. And then you just put a 10 gig network port here and you can access these directly over the network. So it doesn't have as many features as a traditional NAS. On the other hand, it's low cost and super easy to set up. In case you're wondering what's the use case for that, uh, I'll give you a really good example. 
Alex, who's editing this video, he probably has a flashback to when we did the XAI Colossus tour. And uh, I literally got done with the tour. I dumped all of the data from all of the folks that were filming and recording stuff on site. And I put it onto a little uh, Samsung, I think T7 Shield SSD, one of these little ruggedized ones, stuck it into a FedEx envelope and sent it to him overnight. And so the advantage of that is you can literally just go and take one of these drives, have all your footage and stuff that you collect on the road, hook it up and then you're gonna see that it's ready to go. It's connected to this and now it's on the network. And so for a lot of folks, I think like Sony can do this and a couple other cameras, uh, you can record right onto the SSDs. And if you do that, this is a really easy way to go on-ramp footage onto a network, right? You have your traditional NAS, you maybe have a workstation like the Mac mini that's over there. And then another fourth one might be this, which is the iCool Core R2 Max, which has two, two and a half gig ports. It also has two 10 gig ports. We're gonna be doing a review of this one pretty soon. But uh, if you've seen our little iCool Core R2, which I think is over there, uh, review, and you wanted something that has 10 gig networking, which is a big feature request, uh, this is it. And so with the two two and a half gig connections and two 10 gig connections, one of them going into one of these switches, you can have all the stuff that you need. You can have your Wi-Fi networks, you can have your WAN, all that kind of stuff, all in one little box. And so for someone that's maybe a solo shooter, a photographer, small video productions, a little switch like this means that you're taking what used to be on a single machine. You'd have to go connect everything up to your Mac or your Windows PC or something like that. And you can now put it all on the network because you have 10 gig in all the devices and a cheap switch like this. And sorry, I should say low cost switch because it's definitely not the cheapest switch out there, but on the other hand, it's very low cost, especially for all that you're getting in this. With that, I think it's time to get to key lessons learned. Okay, so with all these videos, I like to have key lessons learned. I mean, what do we learn with this switch? So I think the big thing that we learned is that if you want a low power 10G based T switch, well, you're not going and buying a CRS 305 and putting like SFP adapters in there or something like that. You're not, not gonna do that anymore. Instead, you're just gonna buy this thing for $199 or less. Frankly, at that price, I mean, I don't necessarily know if it makes a lot of sense to go to some of the like off-brand uh, things on AliExpress. I mean, especially once these things start hitting in bigger volume and the prices start hitting that kind of normal street price discount that we see on Microtik products. I mean, I, I think this is just a category killer. And if you are a Ubiquiti user or you're not a Ubiquiti user, but you saw that like four port switch, you're like, I must have it. It's only $299, um, but you're not really using it for anything other than just kind of connecting things to, and you just don't really care about it otherwise then this is just frankly a much better deal, right? It's gonna end up being closer to like half the price of what Ubiquiti charges, right? So I think that this is much better from that perspective. Also, the power consumption is very good. I wouldn't say that this uses a ton of power by any means. It's also a silent switch. There are tons of different ways to power this. It has a management interface if you do need that. And overall, when we did the review of the CRS 305, I remember just saying like, you know, this is the kind of switch that you put in your backpack and you just kind of have because every once in a while, you just need to connect a couple things I just kind of get that working. And then what ends up happening, of course, is that this just kind of sits there and it gets to continually used over a period of time. So you just end up buying more of these because they're like 125 bucks or something like that, right? And I think this is gonna end up being the 10G base T equivalent where, you know, you're gonna have this because you can do lower speed networking, you can do 10G base T networking on it. It's super, you know, low power. It's relatively light. And it's one of these like really good things to have in your backpack if you need it. But also if you have a small network where you have like a workstation, maybe a Mac mini, Mac studio, something like that, and you also have a NAS and a couple of other devices, then this has all the extra 10 G base T connectivity that you need. And so I actually think this is a great switch for that. Hey guys, I hope you like this look at the Microtik CRS 304. If you did like it, well, why don't you go share it with your friends and coworkers, but also tell me what you think down below. And while you're at it, why don't you give this video a like, click subscribe and turn on those notifications so you can see whenever we come out with great new videos. As always, thanks for watching. Have an awesome day.